This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. the podcast making public transit taking kiss stealing wheeling dealing son of the gun tim the nerd welcoming you to another episode of friends talking nerdy a proud member of the deluxe edition network head to deluxe edition network.com to find out more information about all of the wonderful shows on the network and sitting next to me looking totally adorable tonight we have the greatest legal mind of the pacific northwest professor aubrey how you doing well hello there hello Hello there, hello there. I am feeling particularly professory mm-hmm. because I just finished teaching class. Yes, it is indeed that night here, and you know that is the beauty of having a schedule like that. You generally know in the week when the good, best time to record is going to be, even if you have a cat in heat who wants all your attention. <laughs> That doesn't happen to be happening at the Friends Talking Nerdy Studios, does it? No, we don't have Mimsy at the door right now. Um, thank for thankfully, we have voice isolation on GarageBand as we record this. But uh, yeah, we do. We, we totally don't have Mimsy at the door. Like, oh my god, humans! I need to make babies. Help me, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> yeah, basically, that's what she does all the time. And then Annie just is attacking things. Yeah, yeah, I, there was a great uh, picture from uh, an episode of AEW. Um, it involves Samoa Joe and this uh, no-name wrestler. And Samoa Joe, so one of his f- uh, favorite moves that he routinely does is that he'll, uh, his opponent will get do a top rope move and then jump off, but then he'll just casually turn and walk away. And then as the opponent um, lands on the ground, um, you know, having hit nothing. And the funny part about the picture was that the no-name guy, you know, as Joe was walking away, was looking like, huh? <laughs> oh, man. You know, and then I took that and used it for a cat meme you know like i put uh over the guy that was jumping in the air i I put um you know me trying to get a good night's sleep and then samoa joe walking away is my cat attacking my feet Mm -hmm, exactly yeah but you have had quite a week this week i have i've had a great week so far and you wanted to tell the folks at home about something called a hopscotch that's right so hopscotch is this art exhibit there are a number of them around the country and around the world, mm. um, and you pay a ticket price, and there are two bars inside where you can purchase drinks. So it is sort of the opposite of Burning Man, mm. where everything is you're supposed to be like self-reliant and bring your own thing, and people will give you drinks, and um, the art is, you know, the artists are hanging out with the art, and it's not like that. It's like you pay to get in, and it's really cool and it's there 24 hours a day 365 days a year Mm. it's not open then but it's like exists in your mind no (laughs) like you could go there and so it's this really great very trippy place to go okay lots of lights lots of led lights there is a trampoline that is like being in space there is a graf- virtual graffiti. There is a adult-sized ballroom to play in. So it's like Chuck E. Cheese for the, you know, uh, upper middle class of Portland. <laughs> yeah. The Chuck E. Cheese ball pit, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like 30 bucks to get in there. You frolic for a couple of hours. You know, I don't know. I had a good time. How did you uh, first hear about this? My sister went. hmm And so she told me about it. What was your favorite moment there? Probably the moment that I was on the trampoline that was like in space. It wasn't really a trampoline. It was a giant, it was more like a giant bouncy castle. 
but it was like in a room. So it was just the bottom of the bouncy castle. But so, you know, bouncy castles, they don't bounce like a trampoline. They sort of <laughs> sort of move around. Exactly. Irregularly. And so I got on it and I had, to, it was like propelling me forward. So I decided that I would lean back, keep <laughs> my hands flat at my sides and do high knee walking and I essentially was a very funny walk and everybody that was there started dying laughing at me <laughs> and I thought it was really funny that that happened so it sounds like you made friends no I hated the people that were around us because you know when you're in a museum you get with these people and they stay with you the whole time, no matter how you try to get rid of them or get away from them. Kind of like South Park when the boys went zip lining. Yes, exactly like zip lining. <laughs> but these, there were a couple of people who had obviously been there many, many times, and they really liked telling other people what to do and taking photos. And so they were constantly telling people, like, everybody sit on this bench and I'll take a photo of everyone. I was like, I don't want to take a picture with you on a bench, lady that I don't know. And then... But we're sharing the moment. <laughs> yeah, they were just obnoxious. But at the end of the day, you, you had a great still time. had fun. Had a great time. Despite those people. Yes. Those human trash. <laughs> they reminded me of French tourists. Anything else you'd have to say about, <laughs> about this hopscotch event? Where in Portland is it? Is it's said. in downtown southeast Portland um, in the goat blocks. So where the goats used to roam is now a giant building mm. and contains within... Upper middle class trash. Uh, for middle class. Church, okay. <laughs> Welcome to Portland. We love you here. <laughs> you upper middle class people. You trashy people. But anything else you want to say? Nope, that was it. That's the report. All right. Well, How about you? What's going on with you this week? Well, let me tell you a story about the dumbest human being alive. Have you ever heard of Billy Corgan? Yes. Yes, uh, for folks that don't know, Smashing Pumpkins. Yes, he was the lead singer um, and one of the founding members of the Smashing Pumpkins, one of the iconic um, bands from uh, the '90s, and um, you know the early 2000s. You know, they okay, have 90, sure. 90s. 90s was their most impactful time, yeah. yeah. But, you know, Billy Corgan, like anybody, has has interest, and in one of his interests is professional wrestling. Hey! Yeah, he's been involved in the business in some way, shape, or form for years. Um, but a few years back, uh, right before the pandemic, uh, he actually purchased the National Wrestling Alliance, which is still around, actually. The NWA? Yeah, even though the WWE has most of the iconic moments that were fought for the NWA championship in their own video library, they don't own the NWA outright. Mm. So, um, and, you know, Billy Corgan ended up buying it, and for a while before the pandemic had, you know, a nice little thing going, then the pandemic kind of, you know, threw a wrench in the works for everybody. Um, but, you know, the, the, good, the good thing about being a uh, lead singer and the main songwriter for one of the most popular bands of the 90s is that you have enough money to be able to fund a small-ish production like this. Like, the NWA is studio wrestling, you know, so they're not traveling to arenas around the country or anything gotcha. like that. It's one central location. So, in terms of cost, um, you know, like, I couldn't pull it off, but, you know, Billy Corgan easily could can pull this off. Yeah. Um. So he, like anybody, wants to build his company up and recently teased that he was in contact with a top 20 broadcaster about bringing the NWA and a reality show to their network. And then he announced that that uh, broadcaster was the CW. Uh, the number Whoa. five rated uh, broadcast network in America, um, which is not saying much. It's like, you know, being the tallest. Fifth of five. Yeah, this it's like being the tallest midget, I guess, in those type of thing. Um, but uh, it's still out there. It's still free TV because his show mainly is on YouTube. Um, so the CW is going to be a step was going to be a step above. So it was a he announced it. The CW did not come out with their own press release, but you know, let's be honest here with uh, organizations like that. If Billy Corgan was lying, they would have immediately came out with this is not happening. Yeah, did not happen. 
A couple days after the announcement, the NWA had a pay-per-view. Uh, they call it Sawin. It's spelled the Samhain, but Sawin, uh -huh. I guess is how it's pronounced. Sawin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess a little, a little under 300 people bought that pay-per-view. <laughs> and there was a part of the pay-per-view that Billy Corgan approved, and this has been confirmed that he approved it, that some bad guy wrestlers were sitting at a table and ingesting through their noses what appeared to be an illicit substance. Oh, <laughs> a nose substance. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, if I remember correctly, it was not outright said, you know, they're doing cocaine. But, you know, when you have the, you know, the wrestlers in question, you know, putting a little tiny spoon up to their nose, you know, it's not hard to put two and two together. No spoon points directly at cocaine, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So um, what ended up happening and what usually happens in situations like this is that, you know, videos, videos from that pay-per-view made it online and it went viral fast in the worst possible way for Billy Corgan. <laughs> because according to news reports, the CW, a broadcast television network that was considering taking on the NWA as programming, saw that this company, that, that there was a pending contract out there for allowing... To allowing their wrestlers to pretend, you know, that I, I don't know if that was pretend or not, but it was the given the idea that they were using illicit, illicit substances. And so what happened, the folks at the CW said, what's the phone number to the WWE? Mm. The WWE is currently shopping around two of their products, uh, WWE Monday Night Raw, their flagship show, um, plus NXT, which is their developmental brand. And uh, the CW in 2024 will be be the proud home of WWE and XT. Wow. All may not be lost necessarily for Billy Corgan because the CW does have their own app. Uh, so uh, there was talk that some of the content that. What was, about the reality show aspect? Uh, that may be on the app as well. It's just, he, this is by far. You don't even need time to kind of show you uh, clarity just how bad of a decision this was. You know, just this should not have happened. Now, I get the argument that some people will say that, you know, wrestling is a story. It's entertainment. It is no different than law and order and stuff like that. And for the most part, I do agree with you. But... Law and Order also doesn't have children's shows that they put out every Saturday. They also don't have a Law and Order video game rated T for teen. They don't have Law and Order's plush dolls that they sell, you know, and stuff like that. There's a lot of professional wrestling that is geared towards a younger audience. And, and um, while the people at the CW are strictly looking at it by the numbers, I don't think that's a bad thing either. Because, you know, when it comes to pro wrestling... A lot of the suspension of disbelief falls on the rustlers making it seem like what you're seeing is real. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case and you're seeing the wrestlers, you know, using illicit substances on TV, I can understand where CW, you know, made the decision that they did. I mean, all may still turn out well for Billy Corgan and the NWA, but this is by far one of the dumbest things I have seen anybody do. And it makes me mad, too, because I, we talked about this the other day, and you noted how mad I got. And the reason I get mad is when you see somebody blow such no pun intended um, such an opportunity like this for just the stupidest reason alive it's it, it you can't help but be upset when you know you're in a you're in like your or my position in life you know, I would love to be able to, you know, have Billy Cork and money to be able to fund some of my entertainment things, you know, you know, and to see him just throw it all away for something just stupid is insulting, mm -hmm. you know, and at the end of the day, yeah, what he does doesn't affect me, but still look at what's happening in the country today with all these rich people. I mean, you have Elon Musk throwing away $44 billion and you know, taking a $44 billion company and making it a $22 billion company. And yet at the end of the day, government will still bail him out. He'll still have his billions. 
you know, people like that get to play around and, and make all kinds of stupid mistakes while you or I, even if we think something wrong, you know, that, that could end up affecting us financially down the road, much more so than a douchebag like Billy Corgan. So it makes me mad too, because of my love for wrestling. I don't want to see wrestling have black eyes like this. It, when wrestling is so stupid that it takes away that suspension of disbelief and you're like, why am I watching this? That's just, you're killing it. What do you think? <laughs> you know, you being the big wrestling fan. Like, oh. Well, I mean, I think it's interesting that there's another company out there that was sort of making inroads until the WWE stepped in, which it makes sense they would do that just to keep their competitor from not doing it from doing it yeah i mean and wwe has a long history um of making sure that anything close to competition is snuffed out at, on the channels that they're on right you know yeah so i think that's unfortunate mm. i think you know we ought to always let a thousand flowers bloom results in better outcomes agreed because i mean what the what professional wrestling in the United States has been lacking uh, since the WWE bought WCW was competition. And now we're getting it. It's just, unfortunately, a lot of this new competition like the NWA, like AEW or Impact Wrestling going back to their original name, TNA Wrestling. Like, they're making these stupid moves. And it's just like, why? There is an audience out there that loves and appreciates wrestling. Even casual fans that think it's silly still can get a kick out of it by, you know, like you, going to the occasional show live. You know, I mean, there's something about pro wrestling that speaks to the American experience in a lot of ways, even though it's, it's you know, an offshoot of something that came long before America was ever thought. You know, the fact that pro wrestling, you know, kind of was born in America, you know, it, it, it represents a lot of the good in the country, in my opinion. You know? Well, I think that's a that's a patriotic way of looking at it. God bless America. Wrestling is going to save the world. Not save the world, but I, I'm always one. I, I, I think entertainment can bring people together i mean that's one thing I, I love about being you know going to a pro wrestling show just looking at the crowd and seeing the diverse group of people that's all there it's not the the, it, the image that most people have in their mind of what a wrestling crowd is 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 just stereotypes yeah you know it is varied uh, uh throughout now granted you're gonna have some hardcore fans like me who you know look through all the you know news sites to find out every bit i, I can have and then you have people that know hulk hogan was a thing once <laughs> you know but um that's the beauty of that and and entertainment you know also even if it is silly entertainment because uh, i'll be the first one to admit wrestling compared to like you know a shakespeare play um you know even though we've had that discussion that there are far more similarities between the two than not you know um it wrestling is what pop art does at its best you know it, it, if another analogy here if you want to compare it to like food it's like a good hot dog a good burger it's not a gourmet dish Right. Got you. Yeah, but Billy Corgan, you are one dumb motherfucker. I mean, just wow. Like, that is, I mean, it won't shock me like a year from now to find out he has to sell this thing. Yeah. I mean, because getting that close to getting on broadcast television, like, he would not have had to have spent that much money to, you know, still make the make the show look good for broadcast TV, you know? Like, wow. Just wow. He's an idiot. Gotcha. Isn't it weird, too, that, like, all the good music legends don't make it, but then the ones that do are just more <laughs> Billy Cork, you know? Think of the ones from his generation that we ended up losing that were masters, and then we have Billy Corgan. You know, I'm a wrestler now. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that much about Billy Corgan, but he seems annoying. Indeed. Indeed. You yeah. wanted to talk about uh, a special art exhibit that apparently has started up again. That is right. So I read that the dinner party 
by Judy Chicago, which was a late 70s, early 80s art installation that was a giant dining table. And it had on it plates and glasses for influential women, artists, scientists, writers, everything, dancers. And so each plate represents the woman that it is for. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the Georgia O'Keeffe plate looks like a beautiful iris and or vulva. Because that's what Georgia O'Keeffe paintings look like. She had a dirty mind. (laughs) Yeah, she must have. I don't know. Anyway, it's really cool. And it also has textiles. So, like, the napkins and everything are all symbolic. Like, the whole thing is symbology and iconography. And I really want to see it. I've wanted to see it since I was in college. And you said it's opening up in Chicago again, correct? Yes. I mean, Chicago is one of the main central hubs, uh, airline-wise, in the United States. So, it is, yeah. you know, I, you know, I think a plane ticket would not be, you know, out of the question in terms of being something exorbitant. But now, what is it about this exhibit that caught your attention when you first became aware of it? By learning about it, I learned about all the women that were portrayed in it. So it was an entree for me into feminism and into appreciating my forebears and teaching me a lot of history, a lot of political history. And, you know, I think it's wonderful to learn through art. It's a very experiential and emotional way of learning, and it stays with you for much longer than, say, a lecture. So I think in some ways it was like that. But I, you know, I was a women's studies major in college, so I'm sure I was exposed to it as part of a class, and then I just was, like, not obsessed with it, but I was like, this is the coolest thing, and so I found a documentary about it, and I just hadn't thought about it for years, Mm -hmm. and then saw it listed as reopening, and I was just, I just couldn't believe it. It was very exciting. Well, nice. Hopefully one day you will get a chance to find yourself in the Windy City and uh, walking through the corridors or wherever the hell this place is at, or the exhibit's at, to be able to check it out. Well, thanks. I hope so, too. Yes, yes. Uh, supporting your favorite artist, um, large or small, is something, you know, anybody here at Friends Talking Nerdy will do, go out of their way to signal boost and support. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And also, too, I, I mean, I do agree with you that, you know, art at its best can take difficult topics and kind of explain them to you better. You know, like take a good episode of The Twilight Zone, um, the House on Maple Street, I think the episode is called. Um, I, I could be wrong on that title, but the whole premise is that there um, was news reports of aliens coming out, and then the neighbors ended up, uh, you know, accusing each other of being aliens or something like that, and then they ended up fighting and killing each other. But it, at the end, it pulls back, and then the aliens, the, the real aliens are like, these people are too violent, and then they leave, you know? Um but having something like that, using art to tell a story like that is allows you to be able to actually say, I can see how that relates to the world as it is today. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can just look at Fahrenheit 411. Fahrenheit 450. Sorry, 451. Yeah. <laughs> You're thinking of the Michael Moore thing, Fahrenheit 911, which Ray Bradbury was pissed off at. I think he tried yeah. to sue him. Yeah, I think he did too. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so that 1984, Tron, Dune, Mad Max, it's all that sort of thing. Exactly. Exactly. So we love art here, ladies and gentlemen. So before we get to our main event, how about we hear a little something from one of our friends at the Deluxe Edition Network? Let's do it. I'd love to hear from them. All right. Take it away. Hey, this is Sammy from Barrel H Chicks, and I'm here with Yen. Hey, everybody. How you doing, Yen? <laughs> I'm feeling amazing. <laughs> yes, you are. Well, what we're here to do today is talk about where you can find Barrel H Chicks. You can find us on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and Good Pods. Yep. 
On the Barrel Age Chicks, we have myself, Sammy. We have Yin, of course. And then we have Snow, Crystal, and Harley. Yep. Um, we enjoy talking about everything from movies to being current moms to being just the ladies of the Barrel Age Flicks boys and their shenanigans in general. Please join us without kids. Thank you. Yes, our podcast is explicit content, so it is definitely not for little ears. But come out, let your hair down to hear the chick side of things. Whoop, whoop. It's we, a shit show. <laughs> please join us. We need some mom time. We have an interesting main event this week. We um, are going to be diving into another article from our good friends at Psychology Today. But the special part about this is that the person who wrote this article follows the show on Instagram. No way. Yes, it is Dr. Karen Stalls now. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. The name of the article here, um, and it was obviously, as the title of the article implies, written in 2020, um, called Five Words to Retire in 2020. Um, also, Karen is the author of the book, on the offensive, prejudice and language, past and present. Um, uh, I've not purchased that book as of yet, but I've you know checked it out on Amazon, and it's definitely something I want to see because I like books like this that do a deep dive on something as powerful as words, because the English language is not subtle in a lot of ways, and you know having this deep dive about the history can kind of open your eyes about excuse me about why some of those innocent jokes you tell may not be so innocent if that makes sense yeah and i think once you become aware of that sort of thing and how that choice of language like you really can begin to see it more in yourself and or sort of arrest it yourself yeah, now, now uh, to be clear, this is not about censoring yourself. Like, if you were an artist writing a story and the character that you are, you know, creating uses language like this, by all means do it if you are speaking the truth of that character. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but, you know, what we're talking about is just normal everyday life because, you know, even though I'm a writer myself, my everyday interactions with people are a different thing altogether. And me misusing a word or not even thinking about how a group of words that come out of my mouth could affect somebody else in a negative way, that's something you got to think of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So what we will do, we will go through the words that she brings up here, read the paragraph, and then we will start some conversation. So do you want me to start things off this week? Yes, please, Tim. Okay, and this one kind of hit home because of my kids. Mm -hmm. And the word in question is mixed. Some multiracial people report being asked the question, are you mixed? Today, mixed is still a common self-identifying label preferred by some stakeholders. It appears in the term mixed blood or mixed babies, although some argue that mixed has negative con connotations of being confused, defective, or suffering an identity crisis. When referring to race or ethnicity, mixed can also be perceived as dehumanizing because the word is tied to animal breeding, where mixed dogs, cats, and horses are seen as barriers to being purebred. This metaphor of impurity or contamination is revealed by other derogatory terms for multiracial people, including mixed breed, half breed, cross breed, mongrel, and mutt. In a 2006 interview, American rapper Kanye West, and again, this is written in 2020, we knew he was off the rails at this point, but he didn't completely go off them just yet. <laughs> Kanye West referred to multiracial women as mutts when he was quoted as saying, me and most of my friends like mutts a lot. Yeah, in the hood, they call them mutts. For these reasons, mixed can be considered racist, and so stakeholders often prefer the terms biracial or multiracial. Important to keep in mind, like, you know, you would probably have some people try and claim that, you know, you could think of mixed like you would mixing ingredients in, in you know, a, a recipe for food or something like that, bringing it all, to, all together into one big happy thing. But, you know, look at our history. I mean, we have a long racist history in this country. We have a long history of treating minorities like animals, you know, and so it's not out of line for somebody, especially a minority in this country, to be affected by this. And, you know, I, I've seen my kids have to deal with this somewhat. You know, their mother is African American. My kids, um, they don't look like black kids. Um, they, they, they're, they look white, but they're part black. 
you know, and they kind of, it's one of those deals where they, they kind of, kind of get the worst of it in a lot of ways from both white people and black people. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, be, be careful when, when using stuff like this. And yeah, you seeing something like mixed, don't, don't say mixed, you know, multiracial is probably, you know, the, 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 best, thing. the best thing to say. Yeah, I agree. Any thoughts? Well, I just think that, like, you wouldn't call the, somebody mulatto. Like, that is just a word that people will not use anymore. And so I think words become that over time. Like, it was completely socially acceptable to call people, multiracial people, mulatto or mixed or crossbreed or whatever. Like, it wasn't awful when it started socially. It was just normal discourse. And then over time, we recognize how fucked up that is. And so we change our language. And so mixed was like a better version of mulatto. You know what I'm saying? I do. And I, that's kind of the tough part about, you know, looking back on history. You don't want to look back on history through today's eyes mm -hmm. necessarily. Like to your point, yeah, going from mulatto to mixed was an improvement, mm -hmm. but we've moved beyond that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, I, I think too, this points to how words can be used to kind of dehumanize people. Mm -hmm. You know, by using the you know the, the phrases that we would use when we talk about you know like crossbreeding animals or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, don't use it. Don't use it. Yeah. You yeah. know, whether it's 2020, 2023 or the year twenty five twenty five. You know, don't use it. There's a deep drop for you. Even if it's a million years. BC, you shouldn't use it. Is that a Ringo reference? No, it's a. Um, mm. Reference to the movie One Million BC. <laughs> Wasn't Ringo in it? Was he? I think he was, yeah. Oh, I had no idea. That's why I said, yeah, anyway. <laughs> you know so many things. Yes, yes. Let's talk about hysteria. Something women love to be called. Go on. Yes. <laughs> hysteria when you're near. Hysterical. Women in general are often unfairly described as emotional, hormonal, or hysterical. Until quite recently, female hysteria was pathologized as a disease. Since ancient times, Egyptian and Greek societies believed that a woman could develop a wandering womb wherein her uterus migrated around her body, placing pressure on other organs and causing disease. By the 18th century, hysteria was viewed as a mental disorder that caused a woman to become anxious, depressed, and emotional. Over time, recommended treatments have included exercise, smelling salts, hysterectomy, sex or abstinence, or pregnancy. Hysteria was considered to be a mental disorder and was listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders until it was removed in 1980. Although hysterical endures as a still sexist term to describe a woman who is considered to be overly emotional or deranged. Absolutely. Don't ever call me hysterical. Don't ever call any other woman hysterical. Mm -hmm. Never use the word hysterical. Even if they're funny. No. <laughs> no. Shut up, Tina. <laughs> Women have been abused, imprisoned privately and by the state, committed to mental institutions, lost all their property, lost the right to see their children. All based on this idea that women are crazy when they don't accept the societal norm, even when it's incredibly damaging to them. Yeah, like, didn't one of the Kennedy sisters get a lobotomy just because she, like, liked to smoke and wear jeans? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's, again, this is one of those dehumanizing terms because the times that I've heard it used, whether it be in movies, TV, or in real life or something like that, it's been dismissive. Oh, she's hysterical. You know, just, you don't have to listen to her. 
And it's not acknowledging the fact that men and women do react to things in different ways. I mean, we kind of talked about this, I think it was earlier today or yesterday. Like, I, you know, I told you about a podcast that I was listening to where you have two male hosts and one female host, and they were talking about um, a pretty intense subject. And at one point, uh, the female host just started crying. Mm -hmm. Women do that. And it's okay to say that. That doesn't make the woman in question from this podcast hysterical. You know, that just, she just got to a point where her emotions overflowed and she had to let them out and they came out through tears. I mean, it happens to me all the time at work. Don't dehumanize in this particular case by using this word because, it, you know, it, it, it is it is dismissive. It's disrespectful. You know, if if you think a woman in your life is emotional for some reason, Ask why, you know? Yeah, I mean, don't try and do the typical guy thing of trying to help, too. I mean, that's guys' instincts. You know, we want to try and help and console and, and do whatever. But, you know, even if it's, you know, the woman is in an emotional state and you would just allow her the chance to rant, let her do it. Be respectful. Give her the respect you would want to do. Don't just outright dismiss her emotions because they are valid. Anything else? Nope, that's it. Let's sure. move on. Yeah, stop rambling. <laughs> I'm just excited about the next one. All right. The next one, homosexual. Homosexual is not a neutral term. It is often considered to be a slur. Through its association with anti-gay attitudes, homosexual has acquired negative connotations of disapproval and judgment. The early gay rights movement was called the homophile movement because activists rejected the word homosexual and its negative implications. Homosexual is further sensationalized because it contains the word sex. This places an, an emphasis on sex, although for gay people, their sexuality is merely an attribute of their humanity. Homosexual also contains the pref prefix homo, which has been used as a slur. Homo is often coupled with descriptors that portray same-sex attraction as something disgusting, unclean, or impure, such as dirty homo or filthy homo. As a result of these negative associations, homosexual is considered derogatory when referring to people. Same-sex oriented people askew the use of homosexual as a self-identifying label, instead referring to themselves by a range of preferred terms, most commonly gay, lesbian, bisexual, or queer. In most usage today, homosexual is perceived as old-fashioned, distancing, and clinical. Historically, the word homosexuality also had medical implications. Until quite recently, same-sex attraction was pathologized as a disease, a sickness, a disorder, or a mental illness. This is still the case in some communities. Reading through this, it, it did remind me of the word Negro. You know, like in this particular case, like as a dictionary definition, I need to put this correctly. <laughs> you know, um, it's in and of itself, I think it can be used as just the dictionary word in there as a label. But much like the term Negro, it has had so much negative connotation that why are you using it? Yeah, you know, and 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 yeah, it it is you know as as the um, paragraph talked about, it is old fashioned. It's one of those things where if somebody says homosexual, you know they're not. Yeah, <laughs> are you one of them homosexuals? <laughs> I'm looking for some homosexuals. I would like to have a homosexual experience here, folks. I mean, this is something, you know, that the queer community has retaken and, you know, call each other homosexuals or homo and, like, punch each other in the arm or whatever, like... But, like, black people using the N-word, that doesn't give people in my spot permission to because they, you know, it, like, if you are reclaiming a word, you are reclaiming it from the damage it has done to you. Someone in my position doesn't have permission to do that. Yeah. You know, it's disrespectful. Any other thoughts? Nope. Let's circle the next one here. Moron. A word I've never used before. <laughs> I use it about 50 times a day. Anyway, mm -hmm. go ahead. Many modern ableist insults were once medical terms. 
idiot, imbecile, and moron were part of a now disused classification system of intelligence that was used by doctors to describe what we now call intellectual disabilities. Moron is a relatively new term. In 1910, psychologist Henry H. Goddard coined the term, coined the word from the Greek word for fool to replace older terms like simpleton and feeble-minded. The American Association for the Study of the Feeble-Minded adopted moron to label adults with an IQ of 51 to 70, with the technical definition of an adult with a mental age between 8 and 12. The word moron is perceived as offensive, not only for insulting intelligence and insinuating intellectual disability, but also for its sinister history. During the early 20th century, a eugenics movement flourished in the, 19th, in the United States. Due to its political influence, more than half of all states passed laws calling for sterilization of the mentally unfit, resulting in an estimated 60,000 non-consensual surgeries. This was a time of record high immigration and numerous immigrants branded morons were either institutionalized or deported. Yeah, I mean, this is weaponizing mental health, weaponizing intellectual disabilities against people yeah which you know even for someone who does use it as freely as i do it is something that at the end of the day could be perceived by somebody as something that would make them think maybe i don't want to talk about my mental health struggles with this person yeah yeah it, it, i mean you gotta be careful i mean I, I i would say with this one maybe there's a slight argument that Compared to some of the other ones on this list, it's not as high up. But again, to the point that I talked about, it, it, even if something as silly as mentioning the word moron in your sentence makes another person in your sphere not willing to open up about their mental health struggles, it's just not worth saying this word. No, it's really not. It reminds me of crazy. So I try to be very sensitive and not say crazy, like that was crazy, he's crazy, that was some crazy shit, because that is a word that's been used against people. And so trying to be more descriptive of what it actually is that you're talking about instead of calling it crazy, but actually trying to describe what it is, like and that, it was really unexpected. <laughs> and that does remind me about, you know, when people talk about like swear words, for instance, and they say like swear words are, you know, lazy or, or like you're dumb for using it. And I don't necessarily agree with that, but I do think it is lazy to constantly use that when there are other ways to express yourself without necessarily having to use that. You can be more creative in terms of uh, doing that too and not just go with the simple standby of fuck you. I mean, there are moments where fuck you works and is appropriate, but you know, sometimes calling somebody a goat fucker, even better. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've kind of decided that I don't think we should use as insults anything that has to do with the human body. Like, you dick, asshole. There goes all my put. Wanker. Wanker. Bloody wanker. Okay, anyway, next. All right, this is the last one here. And it is the phrase, for their age. Oh, God. Um, yeah. Um, which, yeah, I think I, I've at the I'm at the point where I've had this happen a couple times in regards to me and I'm 47. So here we go. Qualifying a compliment is an example of benevolent, benevolent ageism. For example, the phrase, she is beautiful for an older woman. Some might construe this as a compliment and that the person represents someone for others to admire or emulate as they age. For others, the qualifier suggests that this that it is remarkable for an older woman to be beautiful. It also diminishes the compliment by suggesting that the bar is set lower for older women, meaning she's beautiful considering the fact that she is old. In the novel Gone Girl, heroine Amy Elliott Dunn writes in her diary that she is closer to 40 than 30. I'm not just pretty anymore, I am pretty for my age. If the compliment is that someone is beautiful or pretty, then the person's age should be irrelevant. The caveat for her age further implies that it is bad to look her age, and that if she were older than her age, she would not look good. 
The qualifier for their age is not only used in regards to appearance, but also to refer to skills and abilities. For example, he is fit for, for his age. age. Her memory is good for, for her, her age. age. And he dresses well for his age. These phrases suggest that these older people are exceptions to the rule and express a surprise at their abilities, which are considered to be uncharacteristic for their age. Reading this, I thought of Rene Russo. Do you know who that is? I do know Rene Russo. Yes. Um, the first time I heard about her, I believe it was uh, from Lethal Weapon 3. That's her first time in that particular series. But... It seemed like any time she was in a film in the 90s, it was like, Rene Russo looks great at 40. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it happens to every celebrity. It's, yeah. Like, like look how many, like, m m you know, male actors can go 30, 40. Like, Sean Connery was still getting Sexiest Man Alive at 70. And, you know, he probably, you know, could count the times on his on his hand at that point. How many solid bow movements he had or something like that, you know. But women in Hollywood, you know, traditionally up to about 30, they're considered sex symbols after that. Then they're getting, you know, Mother. supporting roles, mothers, you know, barren neighbors, <laughs> something like that. And the further age thing, just to the article, to the article's point here. Yeah. You know, it's like one of those backhanded compliments mm -hmm. that, you know, some people are so great at giving because age shouldn't matter. Like, I mean, depending on what you're doing, like being president of the United States, for example, I think age should be <laughs> a factor in terms of who you vote for. Unless the, I don't think so. Given our current state of affairs. You didn't let me finish unless the other person is a fascist piece of trash. <laughs> um, but there are so many instances. Like, there was a computer firm in town in Portland here that I put in some applications and in, in front, uh, then my friends at Apple were putting in applications in as well. Everybody 30 and under got jobs, got job interviews. Me, nothing. Yeah. You know, I mean, ageism is such a thing. Like, it's so hard to prove because what do you? I mean, they could say, "Well, you know, we didn't like you as well, Tim," and that's all they have to do is prove that there was some other valid reason. Yeah, and th that's why fighting the man is hard. Um, but you know, when it comes to something like this, don't disrespect people you know because of their age if you see a woman that's 65 and you think she's hot say damn she's hot if you see a man that's 72 and you think he's hot and you think he's smart go damn i think he's hot and smart you know their age has nothing to do with it. and their age why did you say the man was smart and you didn't say that about the woman i was trying to not have the same compliment you know it's, but he was hot and smart Okay, and? She was just hot. I'm saying you're being misogynistic in your description of these people. Okay. <laughs> you just patted me on the hand and said, okay. I just, wanna, I just want the listening audience to know that that is just what happened. The physical version of calling somebody hysterical. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. We'll be talking about this later off air. <laughs> okay, this may be the last episode, folks. <laughs> Serial. Anyway, anything else about this article you wanted to bring up to the folks at home? No, I just think we need to constantly be open to the idea that we're saying things that could be hurtful to other people. And why would you want to say something? Like, why are you going to hold on to that? Like, I get to say whatever I want. I've been saying that for years. I just keep saying it. I'll say whatever I want. Well, okay, then be an asshole. Like, that's called being an asshole. And, and you know, the thing is, for pe you know, nobody's telling people in the world that you are forbidden from using these words. It's just if you constantly use them and don't think about the effects of what using those words can do to people, don't be surprised if you suffer backlash. And that's, you know, one thing... I see missing from a lot of people today that that want to talk about you know the the importance of words. They they want to be able to say whatever they want without feeling the backlash. Yeah, you know, and 
I, to, again, I want to make it clear, this is not about censoring. If you're an artist and you're writing a story, a screenplay, whatever, you're making an art exhibit, and using some of these words is the truth that needs to come out in your piece, then by all means, use those words. But you have to be able to defend yourself, too. You have to be able to say, I use these words because X, Y, and Z, this would bring us here, and I'm trying to do something good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anyway, good article here. Definitely recommend you taking the time to check it out. And also, buy her book, On the Offensive, Prejudice and Language, Past and Present. I think I think this is something that I will put on my list of uh, things to buy because, you know, like I said, I love a good book like this that kind of does a deep dive in terms of making you understand the full connotations of stuff as simple as words. Yeah. And if uh, Karen does happen to listen to this, Dr. Karen, we would love to have you on our show to talk about the book. Oh, my gosh. That would be so fun. That's... We could find out all about different words we should stop using. Exactly. Or and We could also find out, like, the history of words that became taboo mm -hmm. or were taboo and became not taboo. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that'll wrap us up. I think it will. Yeah. We're gonna say we're gonna say good night to the folks. Good night, people. Thank you all very much for listening to another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy. Each Monday we'll have something in this podcast space to entertain your ear holes. Until we meet again, we bid you adieu. Farewell. Subscribe to Friends Talking Nerdy on iTunes, the Google Play Music Store, as well as Spotify. Remember to support Friends Talking Nerdy on Patreon. Goodbye, darling.